Today is February the 5th. Yeah. This is Managerial Economics, ECP 3703. We are looking at the three problem sets that are preparatory to the exam. Actually, there are five problem sets. I haven't posted the other two. Um, we're going to work through some of this stuff tonight. Anything I don't finish working through tonight, i got one little problem I haven't quite finished. I will finish these, I will scan them, and I will post the images to Angel so you'll have the solutions to these things. That said, some of the discussion parts of the answers uh, I don't flesh out on paper. That's more for discussion. So if you get questions about that, you want to post them on Angel to the discussion for, for them. Or if you just want to chat about them here in class, that's good. And I'll post this video hopefully in the next day or two for everybody else. Okay? Good. Now, what's on your mind? What's going on? <laughs> Just trying to get it all together. Has anyone finished all the problems at one? Yes. Okay. Did you run into any difficulties there, other than the fact that I, I screwed up? I have no idea what the answers are, so I couldn't tell you about okay. any <laughs> that's, that's a fair enough statement. <laughs> Let me clarify, if you have problem set one with you. Yes, yes. In question number one, it says calculate the approximate amount of consumer surplus that should read at a price of $6,900. I didn't specify that when I first typed this up. So problem number one. Problem set one, part A, the consumer surplus at a price of $6,900. Likewise, if you'll drop to the bottom of that page for question four, B, it says calculate the consumer surplus. That should read at a price of $36. Oh, see, see, I did it on both of them because you didn't say which. That's good. You get extra practice. Do you find that if you keep, keep doing these things repeatedly, they get easier? No. <laughs> okay. Here's another good idea, shock your hell. <laughs> it, like the, it's, it starts with Dynamite Industries. Dynamite? So, dynamite Industries, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what. Because I don't think it's going to hurt, I'm going to go back and do question number one again. Sounds great. We did it one time already. Yeah, and I, I made a couple of mistakes. And when I was correcting them, I wasn't satisfied watching the video, so I shot another video. And I found out I had a math error in that. So we're going to do problem set one, question one, all over again. Okay? So, and I'll try to do it in a way that gives you kind of a routine. Here's a routine. The, the, the deal is, and I think this is probably one of the most important things I'm trying to get across this term. If we can find two prices and the sales volumes at those prices for any company, and we think we have a reasonable estimate of what their demand curve looks like, we can do some pretty powerful things with it. So in the problems I construct, I say that for example, here, in market A, with this price, they sold this many. In this other market, at this price, they sold this many. The markets are very much alike. So we think these are two different points approximately on their demand curve. And in problem one, we had a price of $7,800, at which they sold 4,880 units. So that gave us this point right here. We'll call it point A. And they also tell us that at a price of $6,900, they sold 5,126 units. So again, that's a point. We'll call it point B. And we have a, a working resemblance, anyway, of a demand curve. And as I think we pointed out last class, we know the demand curve isn't precisely through those two lines. We know that there is a scattering of positions out there that would describe it. It may be a little steeper. It may be a little flatter. But we're going to take this as an approximation. Two points does, therefore, construct a straight line. We're going to assume a straight line demand curve, just because it's mathematically easier, but still illustrates all the concepts we want. And we're going to want to, from these two points of data, we're going to construct their demand function, the mathematical statement of their demand. To do that, we need two things. 
We need the slope of the line, and we need the intercept on the quantity axis down here. What I'm going to abbreviate as QINT, the quantity intercept. And when we write the demand equation, it will look like this. The quantity demanded equals the Q intercept minus the slope times cross. That's the usual format for stating the demand equation. A demand equation might read QD equals 1,984 minus 1.6p. That would be a typical demand equation. That's the intercept. Minus 1.6 is the slope of p. What that is really telling us is the amount we sell, or the amount people buy, is dependent upon one variable, the price. That's how we want to bring all these demand equations down. So, how do we find the slope of the line? The slope is equal to, watch carefully, the change in quantity over the change in price. Lock that into your mind and forget about algebra. Because this is not run over rise, this is, or rise over run, this is run over rise, okay? In algebra, when they go graphs, they made your independent variable down here. In economics, we do it exactly the opposite. This is the independent variable. We read these graphs by saying, if the price is such and such, then the quantity demanded or quantity supplied is such and such. So, do we have any comparative change of quantity and price? And yes, we do. We see a change in quantity here, moving along the curve. So we get a delta Q, or change in quantity, of whatever that is, 120, 246. And that corresponds to a change in price in here of 900. That's the delta P. And so our slope on this line, just derived from these two points, is going to be 246 divided by 900. And note that when the price declines, the quantity increases. So if this is a negative change in price, it's a positive change in quantity, the slope of the line going down is always going to be negative for a demand curve. And when we take this out and divide it, it's negative 0.273. That's the slope of the line. I'm sorry, can I ask just one question? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting all night for that. <laughs> That's payback for last week. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, the reason the 900 is negative is because... If we, if, if we go from this point to this point, oh, it's, it it's involves increasing. a negative change in price okay. corresponding to a positive change in quantity. Good. Good okay. clarification. Okay? So and when we look at our usual format for a demand equation, this is going to be minus 0.273p. Okay? And now we've got to figure out... What is the quantity intercept? That is, what is the quantity associated with this point when the demand curve crashes through the horizontal axis? So that's our next step. How do we figure out the quantity intercept? Well, let's go from point B down to the intercept. Okay? We know the slope is negative 0.273. And we know that it is the change in quantity for a corresponding change in price. We don't know how much this quantity is going to change. That's what we're trying to figure out. So dq divided by, but we do know how much the price has got to change. It's got to go from 6,900 to zero. So this is a negative 6,900. Oh, cool. You see how I did that? Yeah. And once you do that on three or four of these problems, it's pretty automatic. So you would take... All right, I forgot. Go ahead, get that written down. How do you solve for delta Q? You cross multiply, right? 6,900 times both times, both sides. So delta Q is 0.273 negative times 900 
and I wrote that down somewhere. 1884, I'm going to round off. About 1884. So that's this distance here. Let me mark this clearly. The distance between the intercept and the point that we were starting at is 1,884 units. That's 0.273 times 900. No, I'm not. Oh. 6,900, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but it's still thank 1884. You. Yeah, it's still 1884. This is a 6900, my mistake. I borrowed the 900 from up there. Reasons known just to me and somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, 1884. So we add the 1884 to the 5126. And we get our intercept, which is 7010. That's our Intercept. Would it be negative 1884? No, because the quantity is going to increase. Okay. As I go from this point to this point, I'm going further out this axis. Okay. Good. Good question. Keep me honest. So we can plug in the intercept 1800, I'm sorry, 7010, and that's our demand equation. QD equals 7010 minus 0.273p. And there's two or three problems like this in the, in the problem sets. But it wouldn't hurt you to create some of your own and just practice doing it. And in fact, just for grins, we're going to do another one just for practice. I'm going to make one up real quick as soon as I think you're through writing this stuff down. Everybody through writing down? Take a note. Let's just do one. From scratch, just off the top of my head. Your marketing people come to you and they say, look, we found out that when we charge a price of $60, our sales, the quantity demanded, is 1,600 units. And we also found that when we charge the price of $50, what would happen to our sales? It would increase. It would increase because we're selling it at a cheaper price. Our sales, in fact, go to, I don't know, uh, 2100 Now, just from those pieces of data, can you construct for me the demand equation? Do you want to yes. put a little, do you want to draw a little diagram? I think it is helpful to draw the diagram. For, I'm a visual person. But if you don't want to, uh, that's okay. This course is offered every term. <laughs> so, 60 and 50 corresponding to 1600 and 2100. I'll give you a point here and a point here, and okay, that's kind of a demand curve. <coughs> You work on your own, and I'll work it up here quietly with myself.
I was anticipating some applause, y'all. Okay. And is that you said 50 or 1? 50. Minus 50. Okay, because over there it looked like it's 500. Oh, 500 divided by 10. Okay. Is 50. Okay. That's right. Okay, I see a couple of heads nodding. That's always a good sign. Or does that mean yet we brought this course? Is it negative or positive? Twenty-five. Hundred. It's a positive. If you have a negative fifty times a negative fifty, you know you're going to increase the quantity. Okay. I know so where I, I know where I missed the minus sign. Anybody else any questions? Hesitation? Just don't know my sign. <laughs> well, remember, you know, if you're going to go from here to here, the price is going negative while farm is going positive. But if I forget there, I might forget all the other stuff, so I got to make sure I. Yeah, and that again, to me, that's why the visual is so helpful, too. Okay, so far. I want to do one thing else on this sample problem right now. I'm going to erase this stuff up here in a second, okay? I want to figure out what my price intercept is. I'm going to need to know that when I start talking about consumer's surplus. So, how do I find the price intercept? It's going to make the quantity zero. Yeah, the quantities. I can start from this point, or I can start from this point, okay? But how do I find the value for this intercept? You go right back up here, except if you're going to go, let's say you're going to go from here. Let's go from this one, right? $2,150, okay? What's going to happen? What's going to be delta Q when I go from here to here? What's going to have to happen to Q? It's going to decrease by $2,100. See that? So go back up here. I know the slope is still negative 50. I know my change in quantity is at negative 2100. Solve for delta P, and that's how I find my price intercept. So you just have to change it around and yeah. just plug in the numbers. Yeah. I, in the first calculation, I knew this number. Okay. In the second calculation, I know this number. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So let me, let me get the garbage out of the way here. And basically, that's what I want right there. I have negative 50 equals negative 2100 over delta P. So delta P is how much that is? That is 42. 42. Positive or negative? Look at the graph. I'm going from here to here. What happens to price? Price increases. So it's So this is a positive 42. I started here, right? I'm going up 42, so my intercept, this is not drawn to scale, but my price intercept now is 50 plus the 42, it's 92. The best way to, if it goes this way, it's going to increase. If it goes this way towards, it's always a negative. If you're going this way, quantity is increasing, price is falling. Okay. If you're going this way, quantity is decreasing, price is rising. It's like everything in life. Once you understand it, it's simple. It is. It's just plugging in the numbers and knowing where to plug in the numbers. Okay. okay. Look at what we got here. We know the intercept. We know that at a price of fifty dollars, we sell twenty-one hundred units. How much is our consumer surplus at fifty dollars price? What is the consumer surplus in here? Somebody told me a minute ago. It's Not the number. number. It's the area of this triangle. Remember that? That's the consumer surplus. What does consumer surplus represent? Define it for me. The money that you could be. You could have earned. You've earned. How much they were willing to spend? How much they were willing to spend? It's the money they were willing to spend, but you didn't get it from them because you charged yeah. everybody the same price. I call it the money walking out the door. Okay? And so now we have a triangle that is what? 42 high, 2100 long. Find the area. Consumer surplus. One half the base times the height. The base is 2100. The height is 42. Thank you. 
4,100. Anybody else confirm that? Good. Bingo, our consumer surplus is 44,100. I'll slow down, make sure you got your notes correct. And you're allowed to wave at me and tell me to shut up anytime you need to so you can finish your notes. Well, I will not take it personally. <laughs> I will not forget it, but I will. <laughs> you made this with the, this time around. You made it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot easier. I didn't rehearse it well enough for that first class. Okay. That was my fault. Okay, what's the total revenue this firm is earning when they sell their product for fifty dollars? How do you figure total revenue? It's price times form. And it is, in fact, the area of this rectangle here. So their total revenue is $50 price times 2,100 units. So what's the total revenue? 50 times 2,100. Are you okay with that? Yeah. So then, what is the total value those customers received? The TVR, the total value received by the customers. You add them together. It's 149, 100. Wait, how did you get the total value? You add the consumer surplus plus the total revenue. Okay, so consumer. Total value received. So how are you how are you doing in your business up here? You're getting about a hundred thousand out of a hundred and fifty thousand. You're shooting at about a six point sixty seven percent performance relative to the theoretical maximum. Okay. Now the second part of this course we're going to get into some discussion on how do you get some of that consumer surplus? We already know some of the basics. We offer price lighting. What is price lighting? We offer this same basic product in three different price ranges with just you know minor differences in it. Slight variations or additions? Say again? Slight variations or additions? Yeah, if it was a lawnmower. We got our basic lawnmower for 50 bucks. We got our lawnmower with a bag on it for 75, and we got our electric start lawnmower for 125. Thank you. Okay, how are we doing so far? Mm -hmm. We did talk about, or did we not talk about selling knives? Yes. yes. Right. And so that's where one-on-one -on -one sales force, mm -hmm. that salesperson's job is to capture as much of that consumer surplus as reasonable without alienating anybody. Okay? So what I would suggest to you, make up your own two points of data and go at it. Do that three or four times and it's, it's just mechanical. Okay? Can I erase the board now? Yes.